We praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining class this morning. It's been uh, two weeks since we have uh, met uh, to study the book of Timothy. So, you know, we really have to make up for four hours. I don't know how I'm going to do that. So it's quite a, uh, and we have three more books to complete, including First Timothy, so totally four books. Uh, we'll see how much speed we can gather today, okay? Uh, before we begin, can uh, can I ask Lyndon to lead us in prayer, please? Lyndon, Philip, can you lead us in prayer, please? Good morning, ma'am. Praise the Lord. You wanted me to uh, pray and start the, the session, right? Yes. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, day that you have blessed us with, Lord Jesus. Thank you for all the sessions that uh, we, we, you enabled us to attend this far, Lord Jesus. Thank you for uh, this... Uh, this uh, paper on... Uh, studying and researching and meditating on the the books written by apostle paul lord jesus help us to understand help us uh, lead us by your spirit to understand the way that you let your saints to write down these epistles lord jesus lead us and 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 guide us make us understand your vision and help us to read and meditate on your word lead uh, Pastor Selena, as she would explain us, make us understand, and Lord Jesus, open our hearts so we could listen to the word and help us to follow your precepts. And we will bless and pray all the students who are attending this class, Lord Jesus, enable us and make this class a blessing for all of us. We ask this in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lyndon. So, Two weeks back, we started uh, a study on uh, First Timothy. We looked at the introduction, the background uh, to First Timothy, and we also began studying uh, Chapter One. Uh, we looked at the uh, Paul's um, brief greetings in uh, Chapter One, and also we looked at the reason why he is. Uh, writing the, uh, what he has written in chapter 1, because in chapter 1 he's basically telling uh, Timothy who he has left at Ephesus to oversee the churches at Ephesus, and for some reason maybe he's heard back from uh, Timothy that, uh, you know, it's, di it's difficult, it's challenging, and maybe he wanted to leave his post and come back and be with uh, Apostle Paul, but uh, Apostle Paul is giving him reasons in First Timothy chapter one. You know why he needs to stay on in um, in Ephesus to continue the work because he says in verses three to seven he says because there's a need for the truth uh, uh, to be established, the doctrine to be the truth, the doctrine to be taught to the people. And verse eight to eleven he is talking basically about you know it's it, that it's a hard place, but he needs to minister there. And then he goes on to talk about how in verses 12 to 16, God uses unworthy people. Verse 17, he's talking about how, you know, uh, you, can, you need to serve uh, because you serve a great God. And verses 18, he says, because you're in a battle and you cannot surrender. Verses 19 to 20, he's talking about, uh, you know, um, uh, not everyone else is called to this, or not everyone else is called to do what he has been uh, called to uh, do. Okay, so we looked at um, uh, verses 1 to verse uh, 15. We'll continue from, uh, from there on. So just give me a minute, please. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Personal experiences? Yeah, we're from verse 15. So can somebody uh, begin to read verses 15 to 17, please? First Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. 
This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in my first that in me first Jesus Christ must might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lyndon. So here Paul is saying, Christ Jesus who came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief in verse 15. Okay, so Paul's claim to be the chief of sinners was not something that, you know, he was, uh, uh, he was using as an expression of uh, his, how humble he was, or, you know, it's not an expression of strange, false humility, but he genuinely felt for, uh, for the sins that he had done, that he had committed, and he genuinely felt that his sins, you know, made him more accountable before God then others okay and it's it's so amazing that even after all these years of great apostolic ministry that paul has been doing and has done for god you know uh, paul focuses on the one main thing and that one main thing is that jesus christ came to save sinners and he calls himself the chief of uh, sinners so uh, i think he's also saying this because he's saying you know if god can save me and how you know st uh, strong ideologies and mindset that i had if he could save me he could save anyone um, else okay so he's maybe just assuring timothy that hey timothy there might be people around you who uh, you know um, can be like me who are persecuting who are you know causing hardships and difficulties but remember that when 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 jesus can save me he can even save people who are causing these difficulties and hardships uh, around you verses 16 and 17 he says you know um, uh, Paul says he's saved as a pattern of mercy to others, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him. So this explains um, another reason why God really loves sinners. You know, God loves sinners um, not just because he loves everyone and he's a God of love. He is love. But also that because, you know, it can become a pattern for those who are going to believe on him. So if one sinner looks at the other sinner and says, hey, you know, this person has changed. God has changed him, can change me, change me as well. You know, it's this pattern is going to create like a, a ripple effect for those who are going to believe on him. And God wants others to see what he uh, can he's doing or how he's working in the lives of um, other people. Okay, so what God did in Paul's life is basically an example, a pattern of his abundant grace and his great patience uh, to encourage others who would also believe in him. And, um, you know, um, after he says this, he's basically, I think, uh, so overwhelmed or awed at who God is, awed at God's love, his patience, his grace, abundant grace, his love, his mercy, that hey, even though I persecuted, I killed so many uh, uh, believers, I put them into prison, I caused so much of hardship, when God can have mercy and show me grace and favor and love, you know, uh, what a wonderful God he is. And so this causes Paul to just break out in praise too. Um, God okay so sometimes when um, when you look at situations in your life and you just don't feel like praising God you know there are times when when we go through challenges when we go through difficulties we just don't feel like uh, praising God and I think at those times we need to look back and really look at God's goodness in our life his faithfulness in the past um, his love that he has shown how he's come through faithful and you know that can cause us to look in anticipation in um, in expectation of what he can do in this situation and in the future for our um, life so Paul is based, and that can cause us to praise God. So we don't have an excuse at any point in our life not. 
to praise God. We have always, you know, either when we're going through the midst of trials, difficulties, loss, pain, we can look back and we can still thank God and praise him for who he is. Amen. Okay, so Paul in verse 17 is breaking forth in praise. He says, now to the king, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Some people use this as a benediction as well. I think it's a beautiful benediction to pronounce. So he says, um, you know, um, you know, that even though God is a God of love, you know, and he can do so much for us, you know, um, uh, all we can do is just uh, praise him. So he just praises him for being the eternal king, immortal, invisible, and who is wise. I'm not going to explain all of that because we already know what is the meaning of eternal. We know what it means when we say God is immortal, invisible, and who alone is um, wise, okay? And he says, be honor and glory forever and ever. So knowing all this about God, Paul is saying, I can't just stop praising him. him. So even if you're going through troubles and hardships, we can still worship God, you know, just declaring and worshiping him for who he uh, is. Okay. If you have trouble worshiping God, it's basically we do not know who he is. We do not know his nature. Okay, so Paul is praising God for who he is and he's just declaring who he is and his attributes. Okay, and so this description of God gives Timothy all the more reason to remain in um, Ephesus. Okay, and uh, he could and should stay there uh, when he looks at the greatness of God. Who is this God? What he can do? The greatness of this God who he is serving and, you know, this God who is worthy uh, of our worship is also worthy of Timothy's sacrifice and also could empower his service in Ephesus. So Paul is telling uh, Timothy that, Timothy, see, even in my situation, when I'm imprisoned and death is impending, impending on me, you know, looming large over me, even in this situation, you know, I'm able to praise God, you know, I think you should do the same. Because when you look at your situation, yes, this is challenging, but you know, look at the greatness of God. You need to know who God is. And, you know, the great God that you are serving, a great God who can uh, give you the strength, who can help you to face the challenges and the difficulties, who will help you to overcome, uh, you know, uh, your uh, your the Red Sea that you face, the mountains that you face, the giants that you face. He says the same God will empower you and the same God is worthy of the sacrifice you're making. So Paul is acknowledging that, hey, Timothy, I know that it's not easy, but I know it's a sacrifice that you have to make to stay on in that place. Okay. Any questions? Verses 15 to 17. Okay, if not, we'll move on to verses 18 to 20. Can somebody read verses 18 to 20, please? Church. Go ahead, Zelotoli. This, this church I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Timonius and Alexander, Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to bless me. Amen. Thank you, Zelotoli. So, verse 18, um, Paul is saying, This charge I commit to you. So, this is the same Greek word for charge that. Uh, you know, he used in First Timothy chapter one, verse three. The verse three that, uh, and I, and I, when I was talking about this word there, I said it's a military word. It's referring to an order from a commanding officer. Okay, so he's saying, you know, I'm charging you to stay back, commanding you to stay back in Ephesus. You know, uh, because. Um, of, uh, uh, you know, the prophecies that were spoken about you. God had spoken uh, to Timothy through others, uh, through the gift of prophecy. And Paul wanted Timothy to consider what the Holy Spirit had spoken 
to him through others in the past and to receive the courage to remain in Ephesus from these um, prophecies. Okay, And Paul also refers to these prophecies again later on in his letter in uh, 2 Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, and his second letter to Timothy in chapter 1, verse um, 6. Okay, And then he says that by them you may wage good warfare. So he's saying that the focus is not on the prophetic word that Timothy heard in the past, but the focus is on the battle right now in front of him. Okay, And he's saying the battle is raging in front of you and you must wage the good warfare. That means you must fight the good warfare fight as it's mentioned in KJV okay so Timothy had a job in front of him it then it's going to be a battle it was not going to be easy or comfortable or carefree for him he had to approach this job that Paul left him to do in Ephesus or this ministry assignment um, as a soldier approaches battle okay a soldier doesn't uh, a good soldier does not leave the battlefield and run away, unless he'd be considered as a coward. Okay. And uh, so Paul is saying, Timothy, that, you know, uh, this gives him, Timothy another reason to remain in Ephesus, that he should sense a responsibility to stay where he felt, even when he felt like leaving, because he was a soldier in battle and he cannot desert his post. Okay. Um, there will be times numerous times when we are uh, in ministry or you know when we are called to do something in church as a volunteer take up ministry assignments some of you full-time ministry some of you the workplace um, you know being an example for God you just feel like quitting you just feel like giving up but uh, you know you can't leave your post you can't leave your assignment unless you know, God tells you that you leave that post and go elsewhere. You need to stay there because ministry, you know, God taught me early on when I wanted to quit uh, uh, a time in my uh, life when I wanted to quit a ministry post assignment, uh, which was, I was finding it very difficult to stay in that place. And God was telling me ministry is not a matter of convenience, but it's a command. You know, it's not your convenience. It's a command. And then, you know, God himself in his time, he brought me out of that place. So uh, it's important that we stay on in our post and we don't desert our post and we are like a soldier in the battlefield. Okay. And verse 19, he's giving him the tools for warfare. What are the tools for the warfare that uh, to fight the battle? Thank you, Jafina. Faith and a good conscience okay so it says faith and a good conscience are essential when battling for the lord they protect us against spiritual attacks of doubt and condemnation okay i think uh, most of the time we want to leave the post because we feel uh, uh, too condemned uh, we we don't feel that we are in the right place or we feel condemned by people. We feel they're put down uh, and all of those things. And also there is doubt, you know, is this the place God wants me to be? Am I in the right place? Am I doing the right thing? And all of those things. So Timothy had to have faith that God is in control and God would guide uh, Timothy to do what he has entrusted to him. And also a good conscience is simply living right before God and man. Okay, so if I do away with good conscience, what happens? What happens if you do away with good conscience? What is Paul telling Timothy? If you do away with good conscience, what is the consequence of it? Sorry? Any answers? What will happen if you, uh, you know, uh, do away with good conscience. Sorry, you lose the battle. Okay. Everyone there in the online class? What, what, what happens if you do away with good conscience? Look at verse 19. It's there. They Hello. Have suffered in their journey with Christ. Okay. What will happen if you do away with conscience? It's saying, you know, if you do away with 
you know, you will shipwreck your faith. Your faith will be shipwrecked. Okay, you will destroy your own faith that you have in God. Okay, so Timothy has to have a good conscience because his enemies would be attacking him. And if Timothy does not conduct himself rightly, then they would have all the more reasons to attack him, you know, because of his behavior, his lifestyle. So a good conscience is connected with good conduct. Okay, so if your conscience is right, that means conscious knowing what is good and what is wrong and doing what is right, you know, you will end up with a good con uh, conduct. Okay, and he says that some of them have rejected this. That means some of them have rejected these weapons. What are these weapons? Faith and good conscience. Okay, and they have shipwrecked their faith. So he's talking about two people that rejected the tools for warfare. Now, these are not just two tools of warfare. There are many tools that God has given us for warfare, but we're just mentioning two here in this context, in the scripture passage. Okay, and he's saying, uh, he mentions two people who have rejected these two tools of faith and good conscience, and he's talking about Hymenius and Alexander. And um, he's saying, uh, I, Hymenius and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, when you read this, you can see how could Paul do this? How can he deliver somebody to Satan? Um, how rude of him, or how... Uh, you know, he's not being gracious, not being compassionate. He's not showing the love of Christ. There is no love of Christ in Paul towards Hymenius and Alexander. What What do you think Paul means when he says, I delivered them to Satan? Any answers? What does Paul mean when he says, I delivered them to Satan? Um, I think we learned it in... Corinthians last time somewhere around by Smith Amman and she told uh, uh, so they just move out of the spiritual covering out of the church for a little time and so they can learn uh, how the world is and what's happening and they can actually be convicted of their sin and they can and when they come back we still accept them I, as far as I remember that's what I learned You're right Jeffina and you're listening to your lectures very carefully thank you so here, uh, yes, you know, he's talking about uh, Hymenius and Alexander. Uh, he mentions Hymenius also in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17, where he's saying, uh, talking about Hymenius in connection with Philetus as a very dangerous man. And uh, one of the doctrines which Hymenius promoted was that the resurrection had already taken uh, place. So he's totally going away from the faith and talk, teaching wrong uh, doctrine. Okay, and regarding Alexander in Second Timothy chapter four, verse fourteen, uh, uh, Paul uh, mentions about Alexander the coppersmith as someone who did much evil. There is a, uh, when he's talking about Alexander the coppers, uh, coppersmith, he says he's someone who did much evil. So. I did much evil to Paul, and so it could possibly mean uh, the same Alexander. And Paul handed over both these men to Satan. Okay, and what does he mean? Uh, Paul did something similar in First Corinthians chapter five, verse five, which Jephina was referring to. He says, "Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord." So that so we understand that these men were actually you know put out of the fellowship of the church, uh, where they no longer were under the spiritual uh, oversight of the church leaders or the spiritual covering, and the intent was you know when they were out of the spiritual covering, they would easily be attacked by the evil one by Satan. Okay, and when you know when they go through hardships and difficulties, they would eventually realize the wrong that they have done. And when they have done that, you know, they would come to their senses, they would repent and, you know, can come back to fellowship and we can take them. So that was the main idea which what Paul was basically uh, doing. So when you go through hardships, difficulties, sickness, loss, we basically go back and say, okay, what did I, what areas did I sin? God, please have mercy, please forgive me. And you know, we repent, we come back to God and, you know, we come back under the spiritual covering and we experience the blessings and the forgiveness and the love of God and the restoration of 
God. So he's saying, um, you know, um, that's why he delivers them to um, Satan. Okay. So when they are in the world, they are on the devil's domain. Okay. And, uh, you know, the punishment was removal of protection uh, from the spiritual covering that they would experience. Uh, where they would inf then they would eventually be inflicted by evil and they would come back uh, to God. Okay, so uh, Paul is giving Timothy more reason to remain in Ephesus, um, and he's saying he should do this because not everyone else does. Okay, um, look at what he says in. Um, we just one minute. Uh, yeah, he's saying you know. Uh, do all of these things because you know uh, there is uh, you know you have to be there you need to uh, you know help these people out you need to do all of these things uh, because there is no one else who is called uh, to do this okay um, and not everyone else is called to this position not everyone else is called to do this see look at hymenius and alexander themselves okay they have gone away from the uh, faith uh, and the fact that some people don't remain faithful to the end you know should give us the reason all the more as people who are holding on to the faith not to give up our so that is why he's saying you know, these people who we know who are in the faith like Hymenaeus and Alexander you know when they themselves can go over the uh, the faith you know uh, and uh, you know uh, there are few people who can go away and there are few people who remain uh, you know to the faith and you are one of them so this gives you another reason why you need to remain in Ephesus okay and he ends that chapter by talking about uh, Hymenus and Alexander any questions any questions in first Timothy Okay, so the key takeaway is uh, what we just read, that we must live, uh, you know, uh, we, we need to hold on to faith and a good conscience, okay? So if we do away with good conscience, it will lead us to shipwreck our own faith or destroy our own faith. And verse 5, where he says, we must live and love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Coming back to good conscience and sincere faith. Okay, any questions? Anything, uh, any any um, doubts you'll have? Anything you'll want me to explain again? Okay, if uh, there are no questions and doubts, we'll move on to chapter two. Okay, so can uh, one of you please read, uh, you know, or we can all read First Timothy chapter two. Therefore, I exalt first. Therefore, I exalt. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah, there are 15 verses, so maybe, uh, sorry, there are 15 verses, so maybe, uh, uh, yeah, Lubega can read uh, seven and or eight, and then John Paul can read the rest. Therefore, I exalt first of all that supplication, prayer, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peace, peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be such test, testify, testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentile in faith and truth. Therefore, I desire that men may men pray everywhere lifting up 
holy hands without wrath and doubting. Amen. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with self-control. Amen. Thank you, Lupega and John Paul. So we look at uh, verse 1. It says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Okay. So what does uh, actually supplication, prayer, intercession, giving of thanks is part of what? Yeah, it's part of our prayer, right? The prayer time. So um, is prayer basically have a rigid... Uh, differentiation with all of these things? Should we rigidly follow all of these things when we are praying? So there is sure, we should. Sorry? I'm saying sure, we should. Yeah, we should, but we don't have to get too rigid on their differentiations, okay? Because there are slight differentiations, but we don't get too rigid on their differentiations. Um, uh, but, of course, we... we uh, use all of these, uh, uh, you know, things when we pray, okay? So, uh, why is Paul suddenly talking about, you know, for us it is chapter 2, but, uh, you know, uh, for Paul it's a, a letter, okay? So, it's a continuation for what he has written about Alexander and Hymenius. And then why does he go on to talk about supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving of thanks to be made for all men? So, what is the connect... Uh, from, you know, the previous verses that we read in First Timothy uh, chapter 1, okay, verses 18 to 20, and what is a connect to what he's writing here in chapter 2, verse 1? Uh, I don't know if I'm right, but... I think he's encouraging Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. <laughs> and maybe he just wants to just give it all to God, just rely on him to pray. Maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. That's a good uh, way of looking at it. Anyone else? So Paul is basically saying in the light of people going away from their faith and, you know, from a good conscience, the first thing I want you to do is what? Pray. Right? It's important for us to pray. Okay? Uh, pray so that people will hold on to their faith and they maintain a good conscience. So he's talking about the importance of prayer. Okay? And he's talking about supplications, prayer, intercession, um, and giving of thanks all have to do with praying and there are different parts of prayer but we will look at um, what each one of them are uh, just for our basic understanding uh, not you know because we want to get too rigid on their differentiation but just for the purpose of our understanding what do you think is supplication what do you think is supplication When a person is making supplication, what he is doing? Basically begging and pleading, right? Uh, making a request, uh, uh, asking for mercy, okay, or protection. And what is a prayer or prayers here talking about? What is prayers? When do people pray? When do people pray? Uh, predominantly when they are in need or expecting or anticipating something. 
Yes, thank you, Lyndon. When we when we basically want something, prayer <laughs> quickly rises up, right? So when we, we lack something, when we want something, we're in need of something, or in a dire situation, we pray. What is intercession? Okay. Uh, well, pleading on behalf of someone with God. Okay. Uh, praying for someone else, pleading on their behalf, uh, standing in the gap for somebody else. Yes, thank you. What is giving of thanks? Thanking for what he has got. Thank you for what he has done and also thanking God in anticipation for what he is going to do and how he is going to answer your prayers. So he's saying, you know, uh, uh, do all this and, you know, should be made for all men. Okay, now the Greek word is here is anthropos, uh, which is gender neutral and therefore meaning people, not men. So it doesn't mean that we don't pray for women and children. It means it's a, it's a neuter general uh, uh, word. Uh, the Greek word is anthropos, meaning people. Um, and uh, one way to practice this is to pray for people everywhere, whenever and everywhere. Okay. So pray for people everywhere, whenever and wherever you are. When you're walking down the street, in your locality, in the mall, you're driving your car, you know, when you see an ambulance, whispers, pray for the person, you know, in the ambulance. Uh, when you see a beggar on the street, when you see a drunkard, you just basically let prayer rise up in your heart for uh, them. So Paul is encouraging Timothy, pray, pray for all of these people who are teaching wrong doctrines, going away from their faith, from their good conscience, okay? And then he goes on in verse 2, he says, For kings and all in authority, that they may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. Okay, So he's also instructing Timothy to pray, which means, you know, uh, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks for whom? Verse 2, what for all men in verse 1. And verse 2, who does he say you need to pray for? for kings and those in authority. Now, why do you think Paul is mentioning here specifically for kings and those in authority? I think if they are good, everything goes well. Yes, because he's saying, you know, if uh, you pray for them, because if they are favorable and good towards you, then you then only can you lead a quiet and a peaceful life uh, and then you can also live in all godliness and uh, reverence okay so he's saying when you pray for those kings and those in authority uh, you know in our context civil authority you know so that people can lead a quiet and peaceful lives and live in godliness and reverence towards god but look at what paul is saying pray for kings you know uh, and i think this would not be very taken well by the early Christians or Christians during Paul's time because of the kind of kings and rulers who were ruling that time, you know, when at this time it was Nero Claudius um, Caesar who, uh, who ruled as the emperor of Rome. And, you know, we know that uh, Nero was somebody who had uh, the Christians severely persecuted. Uh, you know, we read here, uh, it's given in your notes that uh, he was someone who actually burned down 70% um, of Rome so that he could build a bigger palace for himself. And when people turned against that, he blamed it on the Christians. And then hence there was severe persecution that broke out uh, towards the Christians uh, out in Rome. And it had effects everywhere else as well. And um, also, you know, Nero was known for, amu uh, you know, for uh, uh, Amusing people by throwing Christians to animals when they had this, you know, these uh, 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 show in the arenas where they had these Christians sent out and a wild lion or a, a wild animal chasing them and tearing them apart. It was such a, it was like a big, uh, you know, uh, 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 what do you say? Uh, a show for people. People would celebrate, rejoice, clap their hands, scream and shout and all of those things. Uh, and so he used to use them as to amuse people. And also, you know, he's also known for burning Christian as torches um, and, uh, you know, in his garden and for his life of uh, indulgence and extravagance. So we see that uh, in this situation, Paul is saying what God wants us to do is he wants us to pray 
uh, for uh, those in authority, for the kings and uh, those in authority. And even today, you know, we might be going to persecutions, but we need to pray for those in uh, authority so that it can help us. We will be the people who benefit so that we can live quiet and peaceful li lives in all godliness and um, reverence. Okay. So uh, praying like this is going to lead us into fulfilling God's desire also, which is uh, for everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So when we pray, he says, you know, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, that who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, verses 3 and 4. So this praying, he's saying, is also going to lead into fulfilling God's desire which is for everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge. We need to understand when we say that it's God's desire for all men to be saved, it does not mean that all men will be automatically saved, but it also you know, implies that God would have left an element of human response to the gospel. Yes, God wants all men to be saved, but all men automatically are not saved. We know that. That's why we preach and teach the gospel. We take the gospel out to those who are lost. Why? Because there is an element of human response. They have to choose whether they want to accept the gospel or uh, reject it. So it, it is a desire that, you know, even though he wants all men to be saved, it's a desire uh, to have a genuine response from uh, human beings as well, a genuine response from people as well to the gospel, okay? Um, verses 5 to 7, can somebody read verses 5 to 7 please? And before that anyone has any doubts? Verses 1 to 4. No doubts? No questions? Okay, verses 5 to 7, can somebody read that please? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be justified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and, and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So this is one place in the Bible that mentions that we have one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Okay, so uh, the Bible is very clear that salvation is only through Jesus Christ and is the only one who gave himself as a ransom for all. Okay, what does the word ransom mean? What does the word ransom mean? No, on the whole. On the whole, okay. Jeffina says an offering, okay. Paid the price. Okay, thank you, Rubega. Uh, the Greek word for ransom is anti lutron, which means a redemption price. Okay, you're going to the slave market. It has this whole idea of going to the slave market, you know, paying the price and buying a, a slave. Okay, so the same way Jesus paid the price and redeemed us from captivity, from slavery, from being prisoners, uh, he gave his life uh, for the redemption of all people. Okay, who did Jesus redeem us from, or what did he redeem us from? From the sin. Power of sin. Okay, the power of sin, the power of death, and Satan. Okay, so we were slaves of whom? Satan and sin, and Jesus Christ redeemed us. He redeemed us, you know, those who choose to do the redemption that he has paid, you know, can walk and live in freedom because the price has already been. And which means the devil has no longer hold on us 
uh, and we are no longer slaves of sin and death and Satan uh, because Jesus offered the price. Who did Jesus offer the price to? Did he off offer it to Satan? The redemption price was offered to whom? To Satan or to the Father? To, to the Father. Yes, to the Father, right, not to Satan. You know, uh, Jesus offered himself as a price to the Father, you know, uh, so that Satan's legal claim over every individual would be cancelled, okay? And it has been uh, terminated, and Satan has no more claims over us. And so we are here, or we are asked to pray this into effect. Okay, we are asked to pray this into effect, and also, like, like we read in um, the verses, you know, in uh, in verse um, four, that you know, God desires all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. Not only do we pray uh, this, we also preach this. We announce this. We preach this. We preach and announce this good news so that people will come to the truth and will embrace Jesus Christ, and they would be. Um, saved, okay? And Paul says, you know, for for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, uh, uh, and I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher to the Gentiles in faith and in truth, okay? So Paul was a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, okay? Um, how do we know this? How do we know this? Uh, look at what Acts chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 says. Can somebody read that please? Acts 13, 1 and 2. Anyone can read Acts 13, 1 and 2? Now in the church that was in Antioch, the church, there Antioch. were certain prophets and teachers. Go ahead, Zelotoni. Okay. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger because of Syrian Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Verse. Yeah, that, that will do. So here we see that Saul is also mentioned, okay, um, and he's later on he was called Paul, but early in the early church in Antioch, he was known as Saul there, still as Saul. So we see that he was uh, called as a prophet and a teacher, okay. Uh, why do we call Paul as a prophet? Why do we call Paul as a prophet? Okay, he spoke a lot about the second coming, okay? He walked as a prophet because uh, much of the prophetic New Testament scripture was, you know, um, uh, written by Paul, okay? Uh, uh, was And he received all of this, you know, during his 17 years of silent period, you know, received all of this from uh, uh, for uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was taught by God himself. So most of the prophetic New Testament scripture was written by him. And we also see that he serves as a pastor. Okay, he planted many churches. He uh, And he uh, did the role of a pastor. And we also know that he's a teacher. You know, um, he taught many, uh, you know, he taught in churches. His writings were also like, teaching to the people and uh, so we see that a person or an individual can flow in more than one ministry office gifts just as the Lord Jesus determines okay they can flow in more than one ministry gifts just as the Lord Jesus uh, determines so we see also that Paul's ministry was primarily to the uh, Gentiles and so this shows us that God can specific call us to, you know, a specific geographic location or nation or a particular community or a race of uh, people just like he called Paul. We'll stop here and uh, we'll go for our break and we'll come back after the break. Thank you.